According to the Bible's book of Genesis, all men were corrupted during Noah's time, and God decided to destroy his creation with a great flood. The wickedness of men led to the elimination of all living things on earth. With Noah's faith, God instructed Noah to make an ark out of gopher wood consisting of three decks and to build rooms in the ark. The entire ark was to be covered with pitch on the inside and outside, and it had to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. All kinds of animals and insects were gathered, each according to its kind. Seven pairs of each clean kind of animal, and one pair of each unclean kind were brought onto the ark. Noah and the animals entered the ark as instructed by God, while the others carried on with their everyday routine and daily lives, unaware of the events to come. Soon, a catastrophic flood destroyed the earth. The ark was the only rescue in this great flood. On the 17th day of the seventh month, the ark rested on the mountains of Ararat, and God placed a rainbow in the sky vowing to never again send a flood to destroy the earth. Chapter 1 of the book of Genesis is one of the most mythical chapters in the Bible. God instructs Noah to build an ark. It raises an unsolved historical mystery. The ark rested on the mountains of Ararat. In 2009, a stunning discovery in the remote regions of Mount Ararat pointed researchers back to the source of history. something very different. They are the first team to find the wooden structure buried under the ice on the Mount Ararat. This is going to be a very serious foundation. A strong base for researchers for a great many years to come. I think all archaeologists should acknowledge that this is something of a completely different level of uh, evidence than anything that's been presented in modern times. The permanent snow line on Mount Ararat is currently located at around 3,900 meters. The wooden structure that was discovered by the research team was quite high up on the mountain, roughly at an altitude of 4,000 meters above sea level. At that height, the temperature is very cold, so the instance of the wooden structure found embedded in volcanic material and preserved in sediment is believed to have diverged from the glacier. Glacial deposits could have preserved the structure as it's buried under the glacier. The 
this highly controversial discovery could rewrite the history of mankind. Both the Flood and the Ark happened during the times of an ancient civilization. They were both a sign and a miracle that God revealed to man. Can we explain a paranormal miracle with scientific explanations? Can we find evidence to support the existence of the Ark today? An unprecedented exploration, one unlike any other. Seven years of perseverance on a thrilling mission. In times of calamity, a sign has revealed to us something that is even more important than the discovery of the Ark. Dobeyazet, a small town located on the border of eastern Turkey, has been regarded as base camp for many Ark explorers throughout the years. When I think of this seven-year search for the Ark, while it has been adventurous, it has also been a lonely road. Throughout this journey, I feel like an invisible hand has been leading us forward. I still remember my 2004 visit to Do Beyesit. I was there to gather research and film documentary clips for the Noah's Ark attraction in the Marwan Park. Initially, a group of American scientists had planned quite a large-scale expedition to search for the Ark, and we were going to join them. However, they weren't able to obtain the permits, and we got them instead. Therefore, we went by ourselves. It was on that trip that we came to know Ahmet, also known as Parasit. Ahmet Ertugrul grew up in Dobeyazit. He has been fascinated with the stories of the Ark since he was young. He has climbed up the mountain over 200 times and he's also the leader of the rescue team. During the peak of the exploration days in the 1980s, explorers from around the world came to Mount Ararat in the summer season to search for the Ark or Ark-related evidence. Parasert was their guide. But unbeknownst to them, he was also secretly looking for the Ark himself. In October 2004, according to information provided by the locals, the Hong Kong expedition team went on its first expedition and hiked up to over 4,000 meters above sea level. Mount Ararat is a wonderland for many explorers, but underneath the wonder, it's also a tomb. Many people never manage to return home after embarking on their journey in search of the Ark. Those explorers who were able to return home safely wrote thrilling accounts about their experience. The locals call Mount Ararat the Mountain of Pain, as the area is prone to natural disasters. Earthquakes, avalanches, lightning strikes and snowstorms can happen any time without any warning. The thin air up on the mountain range and its steep cliffs make it a physical and psychological challenge for climbers. Together with the Turkish team, the Hong Kong expedition team climbed up to 4,200 meters above sea level for the first time. 
the team had to bear with the ill and unpredictable weather and the symptoms of high altitude sickness that the mountain of pain brought them. During the toughest times of the expedition, the members of the team were blessed and guided by God. They finally made it beyond the snow line, which was at 4,200 meters above sea level, and discovered something inside an ice cave. The object was flat and nestled in a thin layer of ice. The layer beneath the ice was filled with water, and one could vaguely see a dark wooden substance through the thin ice. However, the thin ice beneath the cave was not able to support the weight of the team, and as the water in the cave was deep, our team, who didn't have adequate equipment, was asked to stop the expedition as worsening weather rolled in. We experienced God's miracle in the mountain, and the things we discovered, the things we filmed there, not only were they exhibited in Marwan Park, but the experiences we had during our search for the Ark also changed the lives of many people. When the South Asian tsunami hit the region. However, many people don't believe that Noah's Ark exists. They don't regard it as history. And they disregard the lessons it teaches us. So I always felt that I was fighting this battle by myself. But then, at this juncture, the first person who crossed my path and shared my belief appeared in front of me. The story of a great flood destroying the earth is told in many cultures. Though the details are slightly different, they do, however, share similar elements, such as God revealing signs. A few people picked up on them. So they knew the flood was coming, and they boarded a life-saving boat with animals and escaped the catastrophe. Mount Ararat is located near Turkey's eastern border and is home to many Kurdish people. It also lies close to the borders of Armenia and Iran. Ancient Persians called this mountain Kuinu, which means the mountain of Noah. Ancient Armenians called Mount Ararat Masis Musa, which means the mountain of the Ark. In modern Armenian language, the term Masis has evolved to mean the mother of the earth. Just 90 kilometers from Mount Ararat lies Nakhchivan in Azerbaijan, previously under Soviet rule. It was called a Pobetarian in the ancient times, which means landing place. And its modern name, Nakhchivan, carries a similar meaning it means the first place of settlement. The legend of Noah's Ark being on Mount Ararat is different from any other legends or myths about the Great Flood, because these accounts aren't only mentioned in the Bible, but they are also evident in historical texts and writings. Since the ancient times from 275 BC to 680, Historians from Babylonia, ancient Greece, the Roman Empire, and a Spanish archbishop wrote accounts that mentioned Noah's Ark resting on Mount Ararat. All these sources state the existence of the Ark and the precise location of its final resting place. Over hundreds and thousands of years, the silent mountains witnessed the passing footprints of civilizations, empires that rose and fell, terrifying battles, and the shifting of national borders. However, did the more distant history of the Ark leave any traces behind on its soil?
In August 2006, the Turkish expedition team made a remarkable discovery. They climbed up to a cave on the northern face of Mount Ararat, and at over 4,000 meters, they found a structure which appeared to be a wooden wall and collected samples. Three months later, the petrographic examinations conducted by the Applied Geoscience Center of the Department of Earth Sciences of the Hong Kong University confirmed that the sample was petrified wood. This discovery urged the Chinese expedition team to join forces with Turkish researchers forming a science expedition team. The members included Andrew Yun and Yunwin Cheng from Hong Kong, Turkish archaeologist Dr. Özlem Servet, geologist Dr. Ahmed Özbek, together with an experienced 12-man Turkish expedition team led by Parasurt. In February 2007, during midwinter, the team launched their first expedition in the extreme cold and attempted to travel to the expedition site on the mountain. The original five-day trip was disrupted and delayed many times due to bad weather. However, they kept at it and pushed through. I remember that we were in a snowstorm, a really huge snowstorm, and there was nothing that we could do. But after we started praying, quickly, within a few minutes, something truly incredible happened right before our eyes. I saw the overcast skies over the mountain suddenly become bright and sunny. When we returned, the people at the foot of the mountain told us that the entire city had been hit by a big snowstorm. They described that, that it was as if there was a big hole in the sky and a big light illuminating the place on the mountain that we were going to. This special praying experience was like a, a preparation and training for us all so that we could be prepared for a, a much bigger miracle. In the end, the team successfully entered the cave where they discovered a petrified wooden wall. The wall measured 2.6 meters high and 11.5 meters wide. The findings of this expedition were highly regarded by the Turkish government. The Hong Kong team was recognized for their efforts and they were permitted to further their explorations. The discovery of the wooden wall was definitely a very significant milestone. But we wondered if there were any other wood specimens. We looked for further witness accounts and continued our search. The locals believed that the Ark, which was initially intact, was broken into three segments during the earthquake of 1840. The segments were scattered over three unknown locations. The hidden locations of the lost Ark have become targets for many explorers in recent years. For nearly two centuries, People have claimed that they had witnessed or even entered a giant man-made wooden structure located on Mount Ararat, and among them there are a few well-known Ark explorers. In 1955, Fernand Navarra, a French explorer, and his 12-year-old son, Raphael, climbed up to 4,200 meters on Mount Ararat. He reportedly found a wooden structure buried in the mountain and he chopped off a five-foot wooden beam from it. In 1969, an American Ark explorer, Alfred Lee, joined forces with a group of South Pole researchers and traveled with French explorer, Fernand Navarra. They returned to the site where he had discovered the wooden structure in 1955. They located the same wooden beam. Wood samples taken from both trips were carbon dated and ranged from over 1,000 years to 5,000 years old. Ed Davis, a U.S. Army sergeant based in northern Iran, described that a local tribe leader led him up the climb to Mount Ararat. He saw the arc that was broken into two pieces, and he passed a lie detector test. After Alfred Lee's detailed analysis, he created a painting based on Davis's descriptions, which appeared to match the structure. However, there had yet to be any substantial evidence. Colonel James Irwin, an American astronaut who 
walked on the moon led several expeditions to Mount Ararat in search of the Ark. He failed to find any sign of the Ark. For the last few decades, American explorers have been utilizing aerial reconnaissance and satellite imagery to aid in the search for the Ark, hoping that this technology could help. However, the satellite images have yet to yield any results. In 2008, Parasut, the leader of the Turkish expedition team, brought stunning news to the Hong Kong team. He had narrowed down the search area according to the information he had gathered and found a giant wooden structure on Mount Ararat at over 4,000 meters above sea level. And he took photographs as evidence. He believed that he had found Noah's Ark. This part here looks like it goes together like this. We've been looking in the cycle of the same place, the same virtual cycle. Information is very clear to us, and we start to work, and we find that some wood in there. My history, it's, they say it's art, but if it's at somebody's history, they say it's wooden house. They can come, they can check what they can see in this high altitude. If they, someone is at their past time, they're crazy, they make their houses in 4,000 meters. It's impossible. Those pictures are stunning. The tenants are sort of them. Yeah, I see that. They're unusual. We think that it's worthwhile for us to research. Clearly. But could the photographs be fake? Were they taken on the mountain? The way it's polished, and just the way it looks. Many of the previous discoveries were fake, so we have to send someone to verify. It's very special. I've never seen anything like that. But it was very dangerous on the mountain. People had died from low temperature syndrome there before. Not to mention the extreme snowstorms and ill weather that plagued the peak. Even Parasut's crew was injured during these powerful snowstorms. Parasut didn't think anyone from the Hong Kong team was physically qualified to go. But if that was the case, how could they verify the structure? Their prayers were answered when a vital person miraculously emerged. So my mission is to verify the existence of the structure. Yes, and once confirmed, I will lead a team up the mountain. Okay, got it. Good. Do you know about the wood too? Uh, yeah, I'm aware He shared a common vision with the expedition team. He volunteered for the mission and was on standby. Though we have a permit to climb the mountain, the place you're heading for isn't on the usual route. And you have to get there quickly, so you can complete the mission within a short time. Hmm. You have to get there quickly. He used to be a physical instructor in the British Army, and he is an experienced mountaineer versed in life-saving skills and abseiling. His name is Liu Fai Panda. It may not be yeah. fully covered with snow, but it may be partially covered. So, um... Okay. Let's have a look. Because what we looked at back here... In my estimation, I think this mission will be an extremely dangerous one for me. It looks like the slopes are quite steep there, right? So the best thing to do is to verify as soon as possible and then descend. Well, because that mountain is very steep. And also, it's freezing cold. If it's that, uh, if it's that cold, it might... So, there might be ice? That's right. It might be frozen. So we don't have much time. Yeah. Uh, I can make it up to 4,000 meters. No problem. How soon can you set off? Um, I guess... Mm, give me at least 24 hours, so I can get all my equipment ready. The... the big stuff. Mm. Thank you. We're counting on you. In October 2008, Panda Lee flew to Van, a city in eastern Turkey from Istanbul. It was his first time in eastern Turkey, and the first thing he encountered was a peaceful protest, which later turned into a bloodbath. A civilian died and over 200 people were injured in Dobayasit. The entire city was locked down. The expedition was postponed and he was sent to Igdir, a more peaceful city, to wait till the political unrest simmered down. At around 2 p.m., we were informed that the state of emergency had been lifted. So after that announcement, we decided to take our chances and headed straight for the mountain. However, at that time, there were quite a few security checkpoints along the route. We had to travel to the outskirts of Dobayazid. So it was sunset when we got there, and we had to climb in the dark.
today is October 23rd. Uh, when we woke up, it was foggy. And that was at 7. At 6 or 7 a.m., it was covering the mountain. Last night, it snowed. But I'm grateful. <laughs> this morning, I said my prayers. I suppose everyone would pray for something like this. Around 8 a.m., the fog began to disperse. Sunlight beamed through the clouds, and the good weather which the team was hoping for finally came. The team packed up and continued to their ascent up the mountain. At around 3,800 meters on Mount Ararat, the slopes became even steeper and more treacherous as they climbed. The weather was unpredictable, and at times the team would get surrounded by a thick fog. For safety's sake, they ascended slowly. Ninety minutes later, they finally arrive at their destination. It's wood. It's wood. Yeah. Yeah. It's real smooth. See that piece over there? I can't see how far it goes, though. Because it's covered in ice. <sighs> this entire wall is frozen solid. It's covered in ice. It's sealed in ice. You know, I think this whole entire piece here, this whole structure, goes all the way to the bottom because it's got a flat surface. See, you can see it now. The camera's panning across it. Can you see it's flat and smooth? It's beautiful. This is definitely wood. Most definitely. Yeah. Wood. Yeah, it's wood. This is a mortise and tenon joint. This piece here is like what Andrew and the pastor from the Hong Kong team saw in the photographs. It's wooden. It's not a rock. You hear that? Okay. <coughs> this is hollow. Right here. It's hollow. Judging from the sound, there was certainly a hollow space behind the wooden wall. It's dangerous. When measuring from the mouth of the cave, this wooden structure lay at about seven meters below the surface. Now I'm going to begin measuring. I'll measure the length of the wooden structure that we can see. I'm pointing at it now. Two point three two meters. Two point three two meters. It's that wide here. The structure was buried under ice and volcanic rock, which appeared as though it had gathered there over a long period of time. Look out. The expedition team had to be very careful. If the cave were to suddenly collapse, they would be buried alive in the ice and rocks. And so they watched every step they took. This big rock here. 
may fall and block the entrance at any time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After the team had verified the hidden wooden structure, they began digging with a 200 meter radius around the cave to search further. Apart from the discovery of the large wooden structure, there were also wooden fragments scattered all over the site. We're now at 4,100, 4,100 meters. Wood inside? Oh yeah. We have to move quickly here because it's very dangerous. Be fast. Yeah, okay. Go, go, go. As midday drew near, the sun started to melt the snow, loosening the volcanic rocks and increasing the risk of the cave's collapse. The team had to move quickly. Yeah. I'm very far down now. And just out here, those two wooden beams go all the way to the outside. They're about 10 meters long. There are two more. Uh, bigger pieces. Just there. But you have to be careful. It's all ice here. It's slippery. Really. This piece is huge. They said that this piece goes from here yeah. all the way to the back. We'll check that fact out later. This is 10 meters long, okay? And this one, I have no idea how long. I hope to see a wooden structure behind this. See, it's wood, okay? It's hollow. Listen to that sound. Hear that? And here's something special. Check out these uneven marks. These marks are caused by scraping with a knife or an ax. It isn't smooth. It isn't polished at all. It's scraped one stroke at a time. Just look at them. Okay. And on the top, up here, scraped. Okay. Yeah. We have to leave quickly. The snow is melting. It's very slippery. The sun is out. It's melting the ice. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, good. The wooden beam protrudes from here. It goes from there, over there, and sticks out in this ditch. I think it's at least 20 meters long. This four hour expedition was more fruitful than any other search for the Ark in the last 200 years. This was the first time in history that the man-made wooden structure above the tree line and above the snow line on Mount Ararat was captured on video. It was an exciting result. The location of the discovery was the most dangerous spot among all the possible sites narrowed down by Parasut at an elevation of over 4,200 meters. Though Panda completed the verification process quickly, his fingers were almost frozen and he nearly fell off the mountain. There were echoes when I knocked on the wood. Oh. But it was very steep in there. There was even broken rocks here. Even an experienced mountaineer considered this a hazardous zone. Considering the danger, would we be facing an impossible mission if we were to return to the site to film and explore even further? His verification is vital to us. It will certainly help to kickstart our next expedition because what he saw over there matched the photographs. It's buried in a lot of rocks. How long does it take to form? The thickness of the wooden beams there, the ancient mortise and tenon joint construction technology, tells us that it isn't something made in the modern day. 
coupled with Panda's description, he says that these wooden structures are huge. They're wooden structures, and he's analyzed the mountain's conditions. So we're planning a large expedition. Because we believe that what's up there could be Noah's Ark, I know that we're going to face a large amount of pressure and many challenges in this journey. To ascend to 4,000 meters, we must prepare ourselves. So we'll need to have a rope here, and this part is tricky. This is something that's extremely risky. We need cold weather clothing and mountaineering gear. We must take the risk. This expedition is something in which we know that we might sacrifice our very lives. Because we have to film. We have to film convincing evidence with our cameras. We must show something that has never been revealed before. We must go for it, take the risk, and accomplish this historical expedition. So to everyone who is willing to take that risk with us, they will have to be very well prepared, including saying prayers. No way, it's dead in there. This right here is a huge flat area. Right here. The team of this large-scale expedition included Andrew Yun, Yung Wing Cheng, who had prior experience on the slopes of Mount Ararat, and a new member, the only lady in the team, Fiona Lung. Fiona has been a recruiter and organizer for the Ark Expedition and was greatly moved by the process, so she is determined to join the next expedition team and climb the treacherous mountain herself. But you must get used to it. Yes, and are you sure you'll be able to make it? In the beginning, I had to raise funds for Panda's trip to verify the find. And we had to raise the funds within a few hours. I thought it was impossible. But what surprised me was that everyone that I called agreed to help us out and donated money. And I thought, why does God take this so seriously? So I got on my knees and prayed. God didn't give me a reply right then, but he put the thought in my mind that uh, it would be great if I witnessed this discovery. So the mountain is like... 5,000 meters high, and we're here somewhere? Um. You may suffer from headaches. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I'm quite worried for Fiona. Can't she manage? And the thing is that we had the discussion about the possibility of her climbing up the mountain and entering the wooden structure. What are her chances? She was in a car accident and had just recovered. You have to carry it yourself. Uh, but after the accident, my shoulder is weak. I can't carry anything. Actually, this arm and this leg, uh, I'm... It's, it's a little troublesome. She's afraid of the cold, and she has no mountaineering experience. She wasn't with us on our last trip. That's an issue. But she... She told us that she was willing to take the risk. This whole pile? The actual environment is exactly like what you see in the photos. And the rocks there are huge. Right. She stands up to the challenge. She's really gung-ho, so we really want to let her have a shot at it, but we don't want to force her. It's 20 degrees below zero there. However, if she succeeds on this mission, she will be the first female explorer to ever to enter the wooden structure on Mount Ararat. A helicopter? Well, the terrain is uneven and rocky. Do I really have to use my body to support myself as I climb? But I've been thinking about my crash. God was watching. He was watching over me. I believe that he will watch over me on my journey this time. You have to pick a direction and keep yeah. climbing. Find a path for yourself. So, then, um, these rocks are all over. When you take a step, you'll never know which one of them is steady, is that right? No, you won't know. That's right. If this is the only chance to go on this expedition, a lot of planning is required and everything needs to be precisely calculated. Constrained by their insufficient budget, the expedition team equipped itself with the best equipment they could afford. We consider transporting our team with a helicopter, but the airflow from those blades would further loosen the volcanic rocks, which is more dangerous. Join us. But because of the danger, we weren't able to ensure their safety. Okay, done. We have rounded up our supporters around the globe so that they can pray for us at certain designated times. Some people may think that we are just a small organization searching for something no one may believe in. It doesn't matter, because we know that we are after something extremely valuable.
The expedition team stepped foot in Turkey once again and advanced to Mount Ararat snow line, which was over 4,000 meters above sea level. But eventually, all the experienced was long periods of waiting. Setbacks, the team placed their faith in God and carried on in the spirit of Him. We'll never be through until my precious faith it leads me back to you. experience showed me that it was really dangerous up there. I was afraid. I didn't want to go. I didn't even want to say any prayers. I didn't want God to touch my heart again. But after a while, I prayed to Him. And I was before Him. He touched me again. And I was blessed with a vision. I was on my knees and God put His hand on my head and said, Fiona, I'm sending you to do this now. I cried until no more sound came out. Even though I was crying hard, I replied to him. I said, I'm willing to go. In October 2009, the Hong Kong team joined the Turkish team and prepared themselves to climb Mount Ararat once more. When we were all ready to go, our itinerary was rescheduled repeatedly. In the end, the most experienced mountaineer, Panda, was not able to join the expedition. May the Almighty Lord continue to show us the way, and may this entire journey be smooth and blessed with safe returns. It is really a big hit that Panda can't make it. And we can't transport all the important equipment we prepared for the climb. It can't come with us now. Oxygen cylinders, for instance. And we don't know what to expect from the wooden structure. So in all honesty, we're not too confident. The journey up the mountain was a trial of faith and a test of willpower. Last night, I was just feeling really bad. And I was thinking, I can't feel dizzy because if I do, I'll have to climb back down. But how could I climb in the dark? What am I going to do? I was afraid. Actually, I was scared. But I wasn't, like, terrified or anything. I wasn't... I just wonder what I'm going to do. How can I make 3,800 meters? How can I get to 4,200 meters? It's impossible. The ascent was delayed and disrupted time and again by the unpredictable weather. 
Having no clue what the mountain would throw at them, the bond between team members was on the verge of breakdown. Because we've been ready to go for the last few days, we should stick to what we talked about. We stay in groups of three. You can enter first and study the surroundings. Because we don't know anything about the conditions in there, we have no idea how to film it. What are we going to do? So maybe we, we want to stay in the, the original pen. We yeah. all go. Yeah. And as long as we can we can stay. No, in and we don't want that we have any risk. That's it one number one. You know, it's if we just keep in like for the this problem side, we want it for this, you want it to this, it doesn't work. <laughs> It's coming in my plan, you can go back to your home. You want to stay longer, and if you don't have faith, <clears throat> even if you, if you no, die. No, it's impossible. We don't you can, want you can it. No, we don't want it to bring you to there to kill you. You know, we want it to bring you to there to see you for the holy places. Well, the bottom line is that I must see it myself. I must witness it and touch it to put my mind at ease. We, we try our best and then go to the rest. Early the next morning, the Turkish team went first to the camp located at 4,000 meters to scout out the location. The Hong Kong team stayed behind at the 2,800 meter campsite and waited for a good time to set off. The summit and the middle of the mountain are two very different worlds. It had snowed all year long and the summit was covered in snow. The team worried about avalanches. Back in the middle of the mountain, the Hong Kong team's world seemed to have come to a halt. They had no idea when it would start turning again. <laughs> Chung, you know what I think? I think that right about now, there's nothing more we can do. Hmm. Well, if the whole team doesn't go up together, it'll be hard for us to shoot. We must travel together. Yeah. This is the only thing we can do now. We'll send as many people up as we can, as far as who goes and who doesn't. Well, that's for God to decide. All we can do is to pray. Hmm. They waited till the next morning until they were informed that they could start. We were standing at 4,000 meters, and I knew that it was the toughest part of the journey, the most challenging part. When we arrived, Parasute asked me, do you think you can do this? At that point, I knew one thing, they would take me up there because they were professionals. But I had no idea what 4,000 meters above sea level would be like. I knew nothing about high altitude sickness, and I had no clue what the most dangerous steep slope made out of volcanic rock would be like. So I replied, I believe in you. To, to my surprise, Parasute said to me, you must believe in yourself. And then suddenly I thought to myself, I thought, believe in myself? How can I believe in myself? No, I have to believe in God. Without any doubt, I believe that God would be with me. I finally arrived at the volcanic rock zone. During the ascent, I couldn't help but notice that some of the rocks were as tall as my waist, and some of them were very loose. I had to put my feet between the gaps in the rocks to pull myself up. It was the only way. For every step I took, I told God, Jesus, I know you are with me. Jesus, please don't leave me alone by myself. Jesus, I can only carry on with your help. 
I am grateful that I thought to pray as I ascended the mountain. The most special thing was that it didn't rain or snow that day. If it had rained or snowed, the rocks would have been slippery and I couldn't have made it to the site. I'm very grateful that the sun was out that day. That's our destination. After this next stretch, we shall be there. It was as if the path was never meant to be walked on. It was covered with volcanic rocks, and the slopes were steep. Once before, Panda had said that the area was dangerous, and he almost tripped and fell. So I said to God, I said to him, My Lord, this is such a treacherous path. I have no idea how you're going to lead us to safety upon the mountain, especially Fiona. But it never occurred to me once that it would be me who would uh, accidentally trip over a, a volcanic rock and slip down the mountain. I slid for about two to three meters. At that moment, my mind went blank. I was saying in my heart, oh Lord, please save me. Very quickly, someone ran down to rescue me. And I pulled myself back up as hard as I could. After a while, Andrew climbed back up. But just when I thought it was safe to move on again, I suddenly heard, people shouting in the front. I had no clue what was going on. Everyone was nervous. Before we started trekking, I knew that big rocks may fall from the mountain at any time. Some of the rocks I saw were as big as a bowling ball, and they rolled down from the top. Occasionally, you'd hear some of the team members even yell, Are you guys deaf? Can't you hear me? Step aside quickly! At that time, a huge rock was rolling down towards Cheng and Fai. If they didn't manage to dodge it, they might have been injured. Under such a chaotic, intense atmosphere, I really... I couldn't think about anything much. I had to climb up the slopes, and I had vertigo. I could only focus on my feet in front of me, one step at a time, and climb up slowly. When I arrived at a very steep slope, I was out of breath and out of energy. I could only carry on moving forward as others pushed me from the back. The team finally made it to the location of the wooden structure safely. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> 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 
members of the team entered each space through different openings. These spaces ranged from 3 meters to over 10 meters in the ground. They were buried in ice and volcanic rocks. When the team mastered the rough location of the wooden structure, they made their way in through these pre-dark narrow passages. This is the opening that we're going to go in. Many loose rocks are rolling down from the top. The opening is very small. Only one person can go in. Our cameraman, Fi, has gone in there. And we're entering one by one. It's uh, dangerous because it's hard to breathe. Um, we can't take any big gear in with us. From a very narrow opening, the team got in to observe the inside. It was a huge and mysterious space. First of all, okay. Yes. First of all, turn the other okay. location. Down. You see location. Ice covered most of the area, yet it was obvious that there was wood beneath it. I'm going in now. Be careful. Okay. In the rope. Yes. Don't worry, I'm here. Yeah, yeah, just come. Okay. With limited time and cramped conditions, the team entered the first space. From what appeared to be a very small and narrow cave from the outside, it was revealed to actually be quite big inside. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes okay. Yes. Yeah. Welcome. So, I've now entered the inside of the wreckage of Noah's Ark. I can see a right here. Can you hear that? It's the sound of wood. Uh huh? And uh, yeah. Now, everyone, let's look up. Up here. Can you see this? Here's a wooden beam. Over here. <laughs> Can you see it? It's uh around two to three meters long. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. This piece here is wood sealed in ice. You can see the wood in here. See that? Okay. This. This is. I had more. The air is thin in here. I have difficulty breathing. And I'm surrounded by wood. Yeah. Now it's so hot, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You come to the computer, son. I finally set foot on the steps. Yeah, I can see it. 
Yeah. Huh? This is ice. I can... I can see wooden walls on both sides. But is the floor also made of wood as well? Hey, turn it off, turn it off, turn it off. I can see that the ceramic structure is wooden. Can you let me see the inside? I can't see it clearly. Shine the light around. Uh, bring your light. Let's go look over. This is a mortise and tenon joint. I believe this is the inside of the wooden structure of Noah's Ark. This may be one of the rooms, and I can see the tenon joint. I see two walls on each side, and there's a wooden beam across the top. What I'm touching now is a wooden beam. It matches the Bible's description, but this is only a small part of it. We have to explore further, but it's very dangerous. And there's not enough air, so we have to go back up. Okay? The space the Hong Kong team entered had a wooden beam across the top, and there were seven wooden pegs on the beam. All right, it's working. Yeah, okay. 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 The team measured the wooden stairs to be 2.5 meters long. The floor was slanted down. The team observed that the walls were made of wood. They were about four meters high and completely sealed in ice. The space became narrower towards the inside. A log of wood and some rope were found at the end of the room. Because then we... The wooden structure was located in a hazardous area. Volcanic rocks kept rolling down the slope. Since the passages into the structure were dug by hand, they might collapse any time. Therefore, part of the crew remained outside to keep watch, as the entire team might have to evacuate immediately if necessary. We have to be very cautious because there's a lot of loose rocks and they roll down here. Whenever the rocks fall, our guides yell to caution everyone else. At one point, we had to hide behind a very big rock just to be safe. If this is the Ark, it would be covered and buried by lots of ice and loose rocks. But those spaces are really hard to go in because they're sealed. Sealed up tight with a lot of ice and rocks. The team had to enter another space by abseiling down into it. The team who went first helped break the ice which sealed the entrance. They found that the air inside was stale and there was a strange smell emitting from within, which caused irritation to the respiratory system and skin, resulting in a possible infection. Therefore, the team put on protective clothing before they entered. <laughs> Inside this space, the floor and wall were certainly made of wood. <coughs> the knocks they made sounded hollow. So <coughs> <coughs> 
down. And the floor was covered with tiny white pellets. The team couldn't tell what they were at the time of exploration. What were they? Could they have been left behind by people who had previously gained access to this room? There was a tiny door on one of the walls, which was roughly one meter tall, and a horrible smell emitted from behind that door. The smell could signal the presence of poisonous gas, and since the door couldn't be opened, the team dared not advance any further into the structure because of too many uncertainties. The walls were tilted slightly, and they had a gentle curve inward. A broken container was found on an inverted triangular platform built in one of the walls. The wooden platform was 1.3 meters high and it seemed very sturdy. It was strong enough to support a person's weight. Um. This space was five meters high, two meters long and two meters wide. Primary test done on the wooden specimen showed that the wood discovered was around 5,000 years old. But was the structure that the expedition team entered an ancient boat as indicated in the folklore of the local people? If it was an ancient boat, could it be the Noah's Ark mentioned in the Bible? Dr. Joel Klenk, a zoo archaeologist who graduated from Harvard University and who has also studied classical Hebrew and prehistory. Proving something that happened during ancient times is impossible. Academics can only trace it back to the source and look for reasonable explanations. As an archaeologist, you look for deductive reasoning. You don't want to take, you know, say this is Noah's Ark and try to prove it. What you try to do is you try to look at all the different types of options and then you look at your data and then you say what op uh, option best supports the conclusion that you're trying to make. Reviewing the history of Mount Ararat, there were four main types of architecture on the mountain, including residential houses religious establishments such as churches, monasteries and temples, shelters for farming animals and military installations. An archaeologist who specializes in the mountainous zones of Mount Ararat in eastern Turkey, Professor Okti Belli, is familiar with the locals' history and cultures over the last few thousand years. He pointed out that the area had a shortage of trees and wood. Most houses and churches were built with what was available, mud bricks for instance, and only a small amount of wood was used for support in these constructions. Most buildings were built in the lower parts of the mountain, and the small amount of wood that was used in old houses or churches had decomposed a long time ago. None of this material was preserved. Dr. Joel Klenk's analysis on the wooden structure found that the structure was in no way similar to ancient religious architecture. For instance, there was no evidence of an altar. When you're looking at uh, major architecture, even from uh, uh, prehistoric or early historic times, I mean, you. you you come to mind the, the pyramid or the ziggurat or the Migdal temple, or it's a, a tower temple. And all of these have very wide bases. And then as you get closer and closer to the top, it becomes narrower and narrower and narrower. Here you have the very reverse. You have a very wide structure at the top. And as you get slowly, slow, as you get deeper into the structure, the structure contracts toward the center. Now, this is very, uh, this does not go along with a theory of a, a major temple. 
Today, the residents of Mount Ararat still lead a semi-nomadic life. They camp and live on the mountain during summer, and they return to their village during the winter. Dr. Klink also opined that in the history of mankind, shepherds would not have gone through so much labor to construct such an elaborate structure just to confine their animals. Normally, what shepherd structures are, are they're shallow pens encased with a fence, or they take part of the natural landscape, they put it in a cave, uh, and they don't line the cave with wood in the for, form of a, uh, an oblong structure. No, they just pack the, uh, the, the animals in there, they cover it with a, a, a slight fence, and then they keep the, the animals there. So to, to claim that it's a shepherd's hut or shepherd's pen is just is, is ridiculous. Rex Geisler is an ARC researcher based in America. In recent years, he collaborated with the Department of Archaeology in the Ataturk University in Turkey to research on ancient pottery and fossil specimens gathered on Mount Ararat. The goal of his research was to find out whether the migration route was related to Noah and the Great Flood. The reality is that no wooden structures have ever been found or documented well on Mount Ararat, to my knowledge. And so whether it be a um, you know, Turkish military installation, an Armenian uh, pre earlier on uh, installation, a Russian installation, uh, there's been really no wooden structure. Mount Ararat was once a highly sought after territory. During World War I, the mountain was divided among three major nations, Turkey, Russia, and Armenia. The Russian government once constructed a railway on Mount Ararat. Ties used for construction were removed by the villagers. For practicality purposes, Russian military installations were built below 3,000 meters. Now, in regard to um, you know, an installation higher up on the mountain, the Russians didn't tend to go up you know, that high all the time. And even if they did, it'd be difficult to uh, communicate, uh, you know, to their comrades unless they were using like a smoke signal. Through rational analysis, the chances of the wooden structure being a house, church, shelter for animals or military installation were discounted by both archaeologists and an experienced art researcher. The only reasonable explanation of the wooden structure discovered on Mount Ararat is 2,000-year-old historical literature and the descriptions of Noah's Ark in the Bible. I don't see another good explanation as to how it could happen, why it would happen, the logic of getting that much wood up that high. So to me, there's a big positive question mark for the first time could this be it? And thus far, in my own mind, rolling this around, thinking about it rationally, I don't have a better explanation. The expedition team went into other spaces and made another stunning discovery. Three of the spaces were linked together. The team climbed into a tunnel which measured about half a person tall and entered the wooden structure. This space was buried deep in the ground. Since the inside of the space had slanting floors, the team had to use ropes to help them move around. At the entrance of this space, a very wide wooden staircase was found. Up to this point, they had found several stairways in the wooden structure. Each of them had different measurements and dimensions. The 
wood found in this space was rougher than in other parts, and it seemed to be more worn out. From this space, the team entered another chamber through an opening which was about one meter by one meter. The door sill was quite high, so the team had to carefully step over it to enter. This space was shaped like a large wooden box. Okay. Okay, we have to move. No. That's it. Thank you. There was a wooden beam on one side of the wall, and there were wooden pegs on it. The theory was that the leashes on the animals were tied to these wooden pegs to confine them to the space. Perhaps a sort of stable or animal pen. The walls in this space, the ceiling and floor, were made of wood. The wooden surface was uneven, as if it was cut by an ancient stone axe. There were pottery pieces on the floor. There were shelves on the wall. Another room was found linked to this space, and there was a tiny window near the top. The wooden structure seemed to stretch beyond the room. <laughs> the team found another wooden staircase. At the top of it, they found that there was a trap door on the ceiling. Time to open. Let's go in for the top floor again. As we see, yeah, same. <coughs> but it's. I have to. Next time we have to open this. Yeah, then we can go up. I feel like it. Now is it full? You can see now.
the expedition team also returned to the wooden structure in which Panda first verified the discovery one year ago. Yeah, it's slow, slow. Slow. It had been a year, so the surroundings had changed. Most of the wooden structure was frozen in ice again. This is the place where Panda was last year. It looks completely different. It's covered in ice. The opening has become quite small. I can still see the wooden wall. This is exactly what Panda saw. This wooden wall covered in ice right here. That's the one. It was quite dangerous when I came in here because those rocks, they could fall in from the top. And the last space discovered was only seen in a photograph taken by the Turkish expedition team during their expedition in July 2008. Since they were unable to ensure the safety of their team, they did not take the unnecessary risk to explore the structure any further. They had accomplished their difficult mission and returned to the campsite. The team was excited, touched, and extremely thrilled. journey up the mountain. We pushed ourselves way beyond our limit. The whole process was rushed. Halfway up, I almost fell off the mountain. I could have injured myself then. Oh, huh. But our entire team shared a common belief, which guided us onward. Thank you, God. Yes, sir. For leading us the whole way. Thank you. Thank you, God. We must remember this experience. I can really yes. feel. I can really feel. Yes. The power of God. Say, it wasn't easy for God to lead our entire team. Yes. We couldn't use a lot of our equipment we took with us. But at least the filming went smoothly. You really super good work, <laughs> Fiona. Fiona. I really mean it. I just didn't expect it. I didn't think you'd make it. I really didn't think that. Look at you. You made it. I didn't think you would walk down that wooden staircase. You did. When I saw the wooden staircase, I was like, whoa, why is there a staircase? I never thought of seeing that there. But for me, coming back was harder. On the way back, I was told uh, that I, I had to leave because of the falling rocks. You had to stay behind. I was so scared. <laughs> The rocks just kept rolling. Just I was so coming. worried. I'm fine. I didn't stop. Really? The moment I found out that you had to stay behind, I was worried. I was okay. But when you joined us again, I couldn't help it. I had to hug you. Though it was a dangerous journey for everyone, we all made it home safely. The most touching thing of this expedition was not only the fact that the team managed to enter the wooden structure above the snow line on Mount Ararat. The most touching thing was that the entire team managed to return safely. I had difficulty breathing and I could only carry on because of God. Yes. I read a book yesterday which said, um, that it doesn't matter what we go through. What matters is that God is always with us. See, this struck me as relevant. So when I was walking just now, I told myself that I was going through this. I'm experiencing it and walking through it. 
But if God wasn't by my side showing me the way up the slope, it would have been meaningless. This time, I wasn't able to join my team. I just couldn't help them. But I was worried about them. During these few days here in Hong Kong, my mother passed on. I was able to do my duties as a son. Then I left again for Turkey. This incident had shown me that the Lord had made special arrangements. Seven days later, Parasut arranged for another trip for Panda Lee to ascend the mountain, during which he accidentally discovered a deeper space. He abseiled into the ice-sealed room and chiseled through the ice layer, confirming that the structure beneath the ice was wooden. The ice layer had formed over a long period of time. Judging by the thickness of the ice, the wooden structure had been frozen for a long time. Push. Because of the melting ice, the ground was very slippery. Our cameraman slipped and fell and slid all the way to the bottom of the wooden structure. Okay. It's very slippery here. All right, I'm filming now. He fell down there. Be careful. When one of the other team members went over to help the cameraman up, Panda took the opportunity to move towards the end of the structure. He was shocked to discover a huge wooden wall that extended down to the bottom about six meters away from him. The entire wall was about 10 meters high. The incidental discovery of this space is very crucial for us. It tells us that the wooden structure up there is truly massive and that within there are more spaces we can explore. In order to solve the biggest mystery in the history of mankind, the expedition team climbed beyond 4,000 meters above sea level and discovered a giant wooden structure. The discovery seemed to match the descriptions in literature and eyewitness accounts. Officials of the Turkish government and cultural ministries highly regarded the significant discovery of the Hong Kong team as being the first team ever to document the entire discovery on video. In 2010, officials of the Turkish government made a trip to Hong Kong and jointly announced this discovery with the expedition team. A mutual agreement of further cooperation was signed and the Hong Kong team members were recognized as honorable citizens. After various press conferences in Beijing and the Netherlands, many experts and high-ranking Turkish government officials had volunteered their assistance on future expeditions and further ARC research. The search for the art touched many people on different levels. Many sharing meetings were held in China, the United States, Malaysia, and Hong Kong. The heart-lifting experience inspired by miracles changed the lives of many. According to the Bible, all men were corrupted during Noah's time. The earth was filled with violence, and Noah was the only righteous man. God decided to destroy the world by sending a great flood, and instructed Noah to build an ark out of gopher wood.
Further analysis of the discovery showed that the wooden structure was built using typical shipbuilding techniques and design, including inclined walls that became narrow at the bottom and built-in shelves. <coughs> you have compartments, a series of compartments to store different goods. And this is entirely consistent, the, the evidence that you present is entirely consistent with a, with a ship, uh, or some sort of vessel, maritime vessel. But what I saw in the film footage um, in no way contradicted what the Bible says in description of the ark. And in fact, I would say visually uh, is in line with what the Bible says about the ark. <laughs> Some of the walls on the wooden structure were certainly covered in a substance, just as the Bible says, to cover it with pitch on the inside and outside. The wooden structure is made of spaces or rooms, just like what the Bible mentions, to make rooms in the ark. The wooden structure was confirmed to have two levels. There might be another level above it too. It fits the descriptions in the Bible with lower, second and third stories. Wooden beams and seven wooden pegs were found, to which the leashes of animals could have been tied to. Just like descriptions in the Bible, God instructed Noah to board the ark with his family and animals, of which there must be seven pairs of each clean kind of animal. The wooden structure was built in a unique manner with tenon construction instead of metal nails. All wooden staircases were made from logs which displayed the ancient building technique and carpentry. The discovery of the wooden structure on Mount Ararat stunned the world, causing drastic discussions and debates. Behind the discovery, an unprecedented revolution may take place and change people's understanding about the beginning of the world. A discovery that may connect the past, the present, and the future. The significance of the discovery in eastern Turkey is, um, if, if uh, things bear out to be uh, true, would be one of the greatest archaeological discoveries of the 21st century. Um, just an, a, an ex extraordinary find and a, a, a treasure trove for science, for history, for paleontology, for geology, um, you know, and not just for Christianity, but also for Judaism, for the Hebrew Bible, and also uh, in the Quran as well. The birth of Earth. Its experiences in the past and its end in the future may be rewritten. The beginning of mankind and their final destination may have to be explored from a new angle. If the wooden structure on Mount Ararat with the ark would save Noah's family and all the animals on Earth, and the accounts recorded in the Bible's book of Genesis was true. Then script dictating the creation of Earth and end of days was already revealed by God a long time ago and recorded in this ancient scripture. In the days of Noah, everyone was eating, drinking, marrying and consumed with violence until the day Noah and his family entered the ark. All of a sudden, a great flood flashed forth with great force and washed away all living things, leaving them completely destroyed. On Noah's 600th birthday, on the 17th day of the second month, all fountains of the great deep were broken up and the rain was upon the earth. It continued for 40 days and nights. The flood began. The water rose until all mountains were covered. All mountains disappeared from the horizons. The ark sailed in the endless water. 
this discovery, uh, shouldn't it be turned out to be the, the, the ark, it, which I believe that it is, uh, would, it ought to be a reminder to our modern world that God will judge the world. That may not sound very nice, but that's the truth. And I would rather have the truth than, an, than, a, than a lie. What sins do the people commit back there? Why did God have to send a great flood to cleanse the earth? No one knows. However, the ark and flood are revelations from God. Today, the disasters that are surrounding us are actually revelations from God. He needs to reset the world.
、地震、海啸，导致核电厂高危设施爆发核辐射泄漏，史无前例嘅复合性灾难，污染全球生态，前所未有嘅灾难。犹如一次世界末日嘅预演，核辐射扩散带嚟生态巨变，食物链大危机令全球恐慌。今日人要逃离原本繁荣安稳嘅城市，圣经预言。将来有相似嘅末世现象。那时，在犹太的应当逃到山上，在房上的不要下来拿家里的东西，在田里的也不要回去取衣裳。当那些日子，怀孕的和奶孩子的有祸了。不过，一切可怕嘅经历都唔会令人类醒觉。核电厂遍布全地，人类祸端将地球推向绝境。今日。人类所作嘅已经去到无法扭转嘅惨况，比上古时代更为严重。就好似今日，全球各地嘅核设施同核武器都唔能够用水可以清洗，系唔系要好似圣经预言所讲，要用火去消灭直尽？昔日挪亚一家因为信靠上帝，藉着方舟从堕落被毁嘅世界之中得到救赎。方舟与洪水嘅记载，并唔系停留喺毁灭，而系。生命得到拯救圣经里面所讲罗亚的日子，灾难系会不知不觉间发生。其实冇人可以预测到末日会几时出现，不过生命总有限期，人生总有洪水。过去七年探索方舟嘅经历里面，我哋唔单止知道咧，方舟系昔日嘅拯救，而且喺我哋最艰难、最危险嘅时候，我哋靠住祈祷，可以真真实实咁经历到耶稣基督嘅保护同埋引导。今日我哋面对大大小小嘅危难，亦都可以得到耶稣基督最大嘅帮助。